Good morning, friends and family of Grace Community Church of Lombard. We again are meeting together in the sanctuary, but I still wanted to communicate the message that we'll be presenting today on Father's Day, just for those who might not be able to get out to church or who might want to tune in from other areas. Being Father's Day, we want to address fathers today. It's been a really unique time this past week so many emotions have been involved and I was just really praising the Lord that this Juneteenth celebration now is a peaceful celebration. It's one that we all can partake in and, and support uh, the blacks even as they remember their deliverance from slavery. Well, today though I want to talk about a spiritual examination. You know, most men are notoriously bad about going to the doctor. Although most of us need a yearly physical, I think most men kind of try to get out of that if they can. They got the disposition, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Or they'll say, I feel fine. Why do we need to spend more money on something that is okay? And so the problem is though, when they're underlying things that they aren't aware of, conditions can grow worse and can even become more expensive as far as health concerns. And that's why insurance companies, of course, will pay for yearly physicals. They want men and women, everybody, to be involved in preventative medicine. You know, men and people in general, though, uh, tend to shy away from a spiritual examination as well. You know, most feel that, you know, I'm just getting along okay. I don't need that much church or... Uh, we'll leave the Bible studies for the schoolboys or the theologians. But this morning on Father's Day, I want to have a surprise spiritual examination. I want us to consider what, how the great physician would examine us this morning. So the first thing I want to look at is, and I'm going to ask fathers, and I want to apply that to grandfathers. I want to apply it to everybody, of course, but fathers... What is the condition of your spiritual skeletal system? Are you standing straight and tall? You know, there's a lot in scripture about bones. And this morning, I'm not gonna be opening the scripture tonight, uh, this morning too much. I haven't quoted any of my notes, and so I'm gonna be reading these verses to you. They come from different parts of the Bible. But in regard to the skeletal system, what is your character like this morning? Are you standing straight and tall? Proverbs 27 says this, The righteous man leads a blameless life. Blessed are his children after him. The question we want to ask ourselves is, do we possess integrity? You know, boy, are we seeing a, lot, a lack of integrity in our society today. We are seeing it in our lawmakers. We are seeing it among police. We are seeing it in the rioters who are demanding their way. We are seeing hatred of whites toward blacks. And then on the other side, we're seeing blacks show that hatred toward whites. We're seeing Democrats hate Republicans. We're seeing Republicans hate Democrats. And it seems like everyone is demanding to get what they want. And probably they all feel that God is on their side. We are living in a society that is not standing straight spiritually. They are twisted and they feel their, their uh, viewpoints are righteous and their demands are righteous. I believe one of the reasons that we are living in this twisted society today, one that lacks integrity, is there is an absence of the influence of godly fathers in America. The home is being broken up in so many ways. Um, and we could go on and state many statistics how there's an absence of fathers in homes today. I want to give you an illustration, though, uh, of, of a family that was anchored in spiritual things. And I was just blessed by reading the story. Uh, the story is about Crawford Loritz. Now, Crawford Loritz is a black pastor. And he's one that is a tremendous speaker. I heard him speak for the first time this week, and I just 
when my daughter asked me, what do you want for Father's Day? I said, I think Crawford Loritz wrote a book and I'd like to get a book and read more of what he's written. But Crawford Loritz is a family that's made up of men who are leaders, fathers who are protectors and lovers of their family. And it all started back with Peter Loritz. Now that name came from a, he was a slave. He was actually freed after the Civil War. And he kind of changed his name a little bit, but he belonged to a, a German family, Loritz or something like that that was close, but he changed the spelling of his name. But Peter, after the Civil War, he worked hard. And he worked and he worked most of his life and he saved up enough money to buy some acreage of property. And that acreage of property became a town uh, Conway or something like that in North Carolina. It's near the Charlotte Speedway. But he also gave a plot of ground for, to a church to be built there. But Peter Loritz met a, a gal uh, and, and he loved this gal and they together raised two sons and a daughter. And Peter was the protector as I mentioned and he was dedicated to his family. And so he raised two boys and a godly a daughter as well. But one of these two boys was the name of Milton. And Milton likewise learned from his father, learned to be a leader, learned to have integrity. That's the thing about the Loritz family. They were men who, who stuck to their word. Whatever they said, they carried out in their life. They weren't ones who would leave their family. They weren't ones to live selfishly on their own. But Milton Loritz and his wife had seven daughters and seven sons. And one of those sons, the youngest son, was the name of Crawford. That's Crawford Loritz Sr. And now today, Crawford Loritz Sr. died when he was, uh, oh, I think he was 91 or something like that. He died near 1991. And his son now, Crawford Loritz Sr., is in his early 70s, and he's doing a great job as a pastor. And he likewise has two sons in the ministry. These men have taken responsibility to be the leaders and the fathers in their family. And uh, some tremendous stories that Crawford told this past week about what his father, what an example his father left for him. And his father would tell him because uh, he was the grandson of Peter Loritz, and he remembers Peter Loritz, uh, the, the, the once slave, uh, sitting on his porch as an old man and singing songs and just talking about his grandchildren and others about the Lord Jesus Christ. It was passed on from generation to generation. Well, we desperately need men of integrity today, men who will stand straight and tall and lead their children and their grandchildren to do the same. Next, we still, considering the skeletal system, let me ask you this, men. Do you possess courage? Proverbs 42.10 says, As with a breaking of my bones, my enemies reproached me while they say to me all day long, Where is your God? Now, you know... We know teenagers deal with peer pressure, but isn't it interesting that even adults and men can buckle under peer pressure? You know, their friends come along and say, hey, we're going for a cycle ride on Sunday. You don't need to go to church every single Sunday. You're not one of those religious types, are you? Well, you know, men can give in to the pressure of friends and work uh, comrades. We just finished a study from the book of Revelation of the churches in Asia Minor. And one of the main problems that those churches had was their willingness to compromise. For the sake of financial and social advantages, they would, you know, be willing to sacrifice a pinch of incense to Caesar and say, Caesar is Lord. But there were those churches and believers who refused to do that, to bow to that idolatrous, society with many gods and many went to their deaths as martyrs but the Lord we read commended them from their courage you remember the story of Braveheart William Wallace over in Scotland now we know the movie it's a it's a good movie but of course things are made as Hollywood presented but 
William Wallace was a godly man, and he would not he he would not stand for the uh, for the way that England was over uh, taking Scotland and doing terrible things to to even wives uh, of, of men in Scotland. So William Wallace fought against uh, Longshanks, the uh, evil king of England. And you remember in the movie there were traitors of, of William Wallace, but William Wallace went to his death, but he cried out in the last, cried out for freedom. True Christian fathers have brave hearts they don't abandon their families. They don't leave when the going gets tough. They don't do impulsive, self-centered things that destroy their homes. They do what they can to take responsibility for their family. And now, they make mistakes. Christian men, even with brave hearts, make mistakes. I heard Brian Loritz say, even talking about his father, Crawford Loritz Jr., that he would even come to school sometimes and take him out of class while they were at school and he would apologize for them, things that he had done wrong. His sons learned that his father was sincere and true. He had courage, he had a brave heart. Well, one more thing when we think about the skeletal system, the spiritual skeletal system, let me ask you this, do you have a clean conscience? If something is eating at you, it can weaken your support system. Listen to David's words from Psalm 32.3 after he had hidden his sin concerning Bathsheba and Uriah. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. You know, one of the major things that we're seeing that Christian men are suffering even today is secret sins. What they might do when nobody else is watching them. David thought he could hide from his sins, but he could not. Secret sins eventually come out into the open. You know, I was reading this past week how how pornography is such big business and in phone sex I mean in 2002 I read a statistic where the, it was generated a billion dollars in 2002 and it's many years later you can imagine how big the business is today the way things are on the internet my brother Dwight who pastored a church in Rochester Minnesota said that he was having difficulty getting men to take jobs in the church and they found out one of the reasons why is because men were guilty. They did not have a clear conscience. So many were involved with pornography. The leaders in that church did this. They paid for an app for every man to have this app on his phone and his wife to have the same app so that the wife could check what her husband was viewing at any time on his laptop or else on his cell phone. These are the words of David after the prophet Nathan confronted him concerning his hidden sin. When he came clean, he said this, Behold, you desire truth, truth in the inward parts. And in the hard, hidden part, you will make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Make me hear joy and gladness, that the bones you have broken may rejoice. Hide me your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit in me. If you have secret sins in your life, it's like having a broken bone. And if you have a broken bone in your limb, you can't put any weight on it. You can't, if it's in your leg, you can't stand on it. That needs to be healed, and it can only be healed through confession and forgiveness. Well, let's go on. We talked about the skeletal system. Let me ask you about how is your nervous system doing, man? The nervous system is a communication system in the body. You know, the, in Scripture, the believers are said to have the mind of Christ. Oftentimes, when a physical examination takes place, when the brain is going to be examined, a CAT scan or an MRI is used to examine the brain. It's a highly diag diagnostic test. But do you know this? The great physician, the Lord, has a much greater diagnostic ability. Jeremiah 17.10 records this. The Lord said, I, the Lord, search the heart and examine the mind 
to reward a man according to his conduct, according to what his deeds deserve. In the book of Ezekiel, the Lord was dealing with the house of Israel, and this is what he said to them. This is what the Lord says, that you, this is what you are saying, O house of Israel, but I know what is going through your mind. So many of us don't have the awareness that the Lord knows what we're thinking at any time. It's exposed wide open to Him. So let me ask you concerning your mind, do you have understanding? You know, Jesus said in Matthew 22, 37, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Our minds deserve to be focused more than anything else on understanding the Lord and His ways. Do you know in the introduction, I think it's the introduction, I remember reading it to J.I. Packer's book, Knowing God. He said in the early parts, uh, in the early America, uh, men after church sometimes they would get together with other families and they would uh, have dinner together. But those men would sit on the porch, and you know what they would do when they'd get together in early America? They would talk about God. They would share things that they'd learned about God, even from Scripture, and experiences that they were having with God. Let me ask you, if you were going to have discussion about the Lord, would the conversation last long? You know, we can talk about tools, jobs we did, cars we did, and we all seem to have stories that we can relate about things that happen. But I wonder if we were talking about God, how long would the conversation last? Are you studying to find out things about Him in Scripture that you can share with others? Are you walking with Him and seeing what He is doing and teaching you in His life? Do you know that in Scripture records that God listens to our conversations? Listen to what God said in Malachi 3.16. Then those who feared the Lord spoke to one another, and the Lord listened and heard them. They weren't speaking to the Lord, they were speaking to one another, and the Lord listened and heard them. So a book of remembrance was written before him for those who fear the Lord and who meditate on his name. Isn't that interesting? The Lord wrote about it, dialogue, wrote down that these people were talking and sharing about it. That's incredible. Now, what does it take to have understanding in your mind? Well, it takes, first of all, it takes a disciplined mind. 1 Peter 1.13 records this, Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind and prepare you. That means prepare your minds for actions. Be sober and rest your hope fully on the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. You know, things about God just don't come naturally, and, and, and some things are so hard to understand. So Paul wrote to Timothy and he said, study, that's the King James Bible, study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. In other translations, that word is spudazo, the word for study, it's to be diligent, be disciplined in your mind so that you can learn the word of God and learn what God is like. Uh, to gain an understanding, we also need a renewed mind. You know, Romans 12, 1 and 2, it's a favorite verse of many. I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You know, Jesus told his disciples that they were clean because of the word he spoke. The word of God is, it, it cleanses us as we take it in. It renews our mind. In order to get understanding, we also need a recalling mind. Psalm 103, 2 says this, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. You know, we tend to think that forgetting is really not that bad. You know, everybody forgets. I'm sorry, I forgot. You know, God does not count that as a very good excuse. Uh, Moses said, and uh, Speaking from the Lord, Deuteronomy chapter 8, he said, Beware lest you, that you do not forget the Lord your God. Again in 8, chapter 8 and verse 14, When your heart is lifted up and you forget the Lord your God. In the 19th verse, he said, Then it shall be if you by any means forget the Lord your God and follow other gods. 
forgetting is not a good excuse. We need to remember. We need to, to hide God's word in our heart. You know, husbands, uh, have you learned that it's, it's not a real great excuse for your wife if you say, I'm sorry, I just forgot about the anniversary. You know, I heard of a pastor once who forgot a funeral. Can you imagine that? The family's all waiting, maybe at the funeral home and the pastor doesn't show up. Wow. How easy would it be for that pastor? How easy would it be that family said, oh, that's all right, pastor. It's okay that you forget. You know, forgetting is telling that person or telling God that those things are really not that important. To have an understanding mind about God, we need a recalling mind. We need a remembering mind. Well, that concerns what the content of our mind, but you know what? There's more to than just the content. We've got to have a right attitude in our mind, which uh, involves a willing mind. You know, 1 Chronicles 28 said this, As for you, my son Solomon, David was speaking, Know the God of your father and serve him with a loyal heart and with a willing mind. In the book of Nehemiah, it said the people rose up to build and the wall was joined together to half its height in a short time. It says, for the people had a mind to work. Do you have a willing mind? You know, it's common in churches when people are asked to do something, they go, Oh, no, I, you know, I just can't do that. There, there's excuses. There. There's a lot of reluctance on people's part. You remember in the son, story of the prodigal son? That son that he didn't leave. He worked in the field. But he had feigned obedience to his father. He really did not love his father. He did not have that willingness, that willful obedience to his father. Well, the right attitude involves a willing mind, involves a humble mind. You know, Philippians tells us, let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus. He humbled himself. It involves a, a same-mindedness. You know, Scripture tells us that we ought to be of one mind. When we're led by the Holy Spirit, we'll tend to think alike. We don't need to have our way all the time. We can work together in a church. And it also... A right attitude in our mind invites a steadfast mind. Isaiah 26, 3 says, You will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. That word stayed means to lean or to support. We look to the Lord and we, we, we look to him to support us. You know, you've heard it criticized of Christians to say that they, they've got a crutch. They, they have a crutch that they lean upon. And you know what? We do. I mean, we'll readily admit that. It's like somebody with a broken leg that they have to lean on their crutch, you know. The book of Proverbs uh, says this, remember this famous verse we talked about it not too long ago, trust in the Lord with all of your heart and lean not, lean not unto your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. We need to have a steadfast mind, a loyal mind leaning upon the Lord rather than our own understanding and wisdom. Well, that we just looked at the skeletal system. We looked at the nervous system. I just want to talk one more thing and talking about this yearly spiritual checkup, man. Fathers, fathers, how is your circulatory system? What is the condition of your ticker? This condition of your heart. That We'll talk about that as the seat, spiritual, the seat of your emotions. What is your love? for your brethren like. Galatians 6.10 says, Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good unto all, especially those who are of the household of faith. Philippians, that second chapter, where it talked about us having the mind of Christ, it said, Let the, nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each one of you look not out to his own interests, but also the interests of others. Are you paying attention to your brothers and sisters in Christ? Do they have burdens that are very heavy to carry? We had one of our persons in our fellowship this week whose business was ransacked, graffiti was written over everything, and 
a lot of destruction done to his place of business. A lot of racial slurs too. Horrible. And you know, so we contacted him said, we'd really like to help out if we could. Please let us help out. Let us help you out. You know, sometimes though, are we of this nature? That when somebody's got some burdens to bear, that we, like the book of James said, we say to him, depart, depart in peace and be warmed and fed, filled. But we don't give them any help. What is your love for the brethren like? What is your love for your wife like? You know, we're told uh, in Ephesians 5, husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church. Isn't it interesting that you watch men, and it can be the same way with women, but you watch men be, be very critical and short-tempered with their wife, just snapping at their wife. They'll be very gracious toward other people and other women in particular that be very kind to them, but they can be very short to their wife. And that can be the other way too with women to their uh, husbands. That's not right. We had a love not just in wor uh, thought, word and deed and in truth every way our wives. What is your love for your children life like? You know, in Ephesians it says, Fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. This is a big one. Fathers, do, do your kids and grandfathers even, do they, your grandchildren, they find that it's pretty hard to please you with anything? Are you the type of father that is always critical of anything that your children or grandchildren do? And even when they are beaming, they've done something, and you just say, well, let me show you how you can have done that better. You know, all they think about you is just work and being serious all the time. Maybe you're going to church, maybe you go regular to church, but when they think of you, they just think of you in a serious and stern mode all the time. Proverbs 15, 30 says this, the light of the eyes rejoices the heart, and a good report makes the bones healthy. A merry, it says 1722, a merry heart does good like medicine, but a broken spirit dries the bones. Fathers, when you, when you leave this world, will your children remember you as one that they, they had a good time with? They enjoyed laughs together? You know, I, I think back over some of the things that I've, my kids have wanted to see me do. They've loved to see me laugh just laughed heartily, they enjoy that. Because so many times we can be so serious. Well, finally, the last one, what is your love for the Lord like at this time? You know, Jesus said we need to love the Lord with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. As we went through the churches at Ephesus, remember the churches of Asia Minor, the church at Ephesus, they lost their first love. You know, when we in time, our love for the Lord can grow cold, even as we focus on things of the world and those things gravitate, grab our attention and we gravitate toward those things and our love for the Lord grows cold. Well, I've got an illustration I wanna to give to you, but just let's summarize. Fathers, grandfathers, even all of us, like, even as we consider a spiritual examination this morning, what's your skeletal and support system like? Are you able to stand tall? Are you evidencing character, integrity, courage, cleanliness, not hiding sins? How about your spiritual nervous system? How about your minds in particular? Are you filling them with understanding about God? And do you have the right mindset, a willing, humble heart, one mind? Is your mind have the right attitudes? And then we looked at the circular t system, your, your loves. How about your love toward the brethren, toward your wife, toward your children? And of course, greatest of all, what is your love like toward the Lord? You know, the love of the Lord, the Bible says, that love ought to be so great, it ought to make the other loves almost look like hate. That's how great our love for the Lord ought to be. And you know, of course, one of the ways that we find out in the book of Ephesus, we need to go back and remember what we first did and did it again. We need to repent, but we need to recall what the Lord has done for us. You know, when he died on the cross and he shed his blood and we focus on what he did to save us from our sins. And he rose again from the dead to give us his righteousness as a free gift to as many as who trust in him. 
And maybe fathers, maybe you are there, one who has never trusted in Jesus Christ alone for your salvation. Maybe you're religious, maybe you go to church, maybe you're a decent, you feel like you're decent. But you know, the Bible says we're all, all have sinned and come short of the law. None of us measure up to God's requirement. In order to go to heaven, we must be perfect. Nobody can be perfect. But Jesus died so that he could give us his righteousness as a free gift. Where that righteousness dwells in our heart, we still have the sin in our heart, but we have new desires. And it comes when we trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, let me give you this illustration. There's not an adequate illustration for loving the Lord with you all your heart. But I thought this was a good one as I read it. Uh, I remember when I was a young teenager, probably 12 or 13, I read this book by Jack London called The Call of the Wild, and I couldn't put it down. I thought it was so exciting. And you know, there's a movie uh, made out of it recently. I haven't seen it. Maybe it's a great movie. I don't know, with Harrison Ford. But you know, he wrote another book called White Fang. White Fang is a story of a dog that is half dog and half wolf. As a puppy, White Fang was abused by his master. He was kicked. He was beaten. The dog was starved. And after several years of abuse, he found his way to a new master. The master was Whedon Scott. And so the story in this book is a section there that where White Fang has a tremendous transformation from his old life to a new life with a new master. It was an animal that had a change of heart. It's a great story. Well, what happened is White Fang was very fond of chicken. And in one way, he found his way into the chicken coop and he killed 50 hens at once. His master, Whedon Scott, took him into the chicken coop and when, when White Fang started lunging toward that chicken, his master would check him. No, White Fang. And, and they spent time after time in there, many hours in the chicken coop. And whenever White Fang would go toward a chicken, Whedon Scott would correct him. Until Whedon Scott was determined that White Fang really knew what he wanted, what his master wanted. Well, Wheaton Scott's father uh, argued that you can't cure a chicken killer. But Wheaton challenged him and said, yeah, I believe White Fang won't go after chickens anymore. So they did a test. His father said, well, let's lock him in the chicken coop and let's just see. And so they did. They put him in the chicken coop, they disappeared, and White Fang's master was gone. So White Fang went over and laid down and went to sleep. Once he got up, walked over the trough of water, took a drink, and the chickens he all calmly ignored. So far as he was concerned, they didn't even exist. And then about four o'clock in the afternoon, he took a running jump, gained the, the roof of the chicken house, and leaped over the fence to the ground outside. And then he sauntered gravely over the house. He had learned the law of his master. Here's an animal that loved his master and wanted to obey his master, and he had a transformation. Well, you know what? That's similar to what happens to those who put their trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. And especially for fathers today, grandfathers, but listen, we need to be men of integrity. And we, more than anything else, need to have the love of the Lord in our life. And that ought to govern and set the course for every direction and every decision that we make. So are we following the Lord with all of our heart and soul and mind and strength? And if we do, the temptations of this world will become weaker in comparison to the joy we find in serving Him. Let's look to the Lord in closing prayer. Our Heavenly Father, now we thank you for this time, we, short time really, we've spent in your word talking to fathers, taking a spiritual examination, Lord, it's our desire that I and all the people that I know would be trust in Jesus Christ and love Him with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength, Lord. We want to see integrity in this society. We want to see it passed on from generation to generation because we're seeing a lack of integrity in our society today. We give you thanks now for this time spent meditating in your word. In Jesus' name we pray and give thanks.